All right, well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited about uh, our research and, and this opportunity to uh, share some of our findings with you. Um, before I get started, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Next Gen Award uh, that, that Children's Cancer Foundation uh, provides. It's an incredible award because it, it takes researchers at this sort of tenuous moment in their career where they're trying to develop a career as physician scientists and it gives us our first funding, our first grant that helps us um, show some success with our research and help us get uh, uh, careers in this, in this field. So it helped me um, secure my first position as a uh, faculty member at Johns Hopkins, help support the research that you're about to see here today. Um, and it, it also helped me gain the sort of track record of success that was able to uh, secure further funding for my research. So thank you for this wonderful award and uh, thank you for all that this foundation does. Um, so as Dr. Tarasky mentioned, I'm going to be talking about atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors. These are the most common malignant brain tumors of infancy. They're very aggressive tumors that affect children between zero and three years old. And while they initially respond to the very intense chemotherapy that we try to combat them with, they very quickly develop drug resistance um, and start proliferating again. These tumors have an uh, unfortunate um, median survival of just six to 11 months. So we're really in dire need of developing new therapies that both extend survival in atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, but also decrease this, this terrible side effects or morbidity from the intensive chemotherapy that we treat them with today. The pathophysiology of ATRTs are very interesting. This aggressive phenotype is born out of a single recurrent genetic mutation um, in the SMARC-B1 gene. This gene encodes for a protein that's an important component of the SWI-SNF chromatin remodeling complex, leading to sort of a faulty or dysfunctional uh, chromatin remodeling complex in these tumors. And that leads to abnormal transcription and translation of proteins um, a wide variety of proteins throughout this tumor. So that can lead to the overexpression of many different oncogenic pathways that then drive this growth, this aggressive phenotype of these tumors. Um, I started with my research um, while we were finishing up the tail end of experiments looking at an important stem cell factor, LIN28 and ATRT. Um, our lab uh, had shown that it's highly upregulated in ATRTs and inhibiting uh, LIN28 leads to an important survival benefit in ATRT. Unfortunately, we have no good uh, pharmacologic inhibitors at this moment of, in, of LIN28. So I started to look at what's downstream of LIN28 that may be upregulated in ATRT and be responsible for driving the growth and tumorigenicity of ATRT. And where I started, um, was with a collaboration um, at St. Jude with uh, Brent Orr that you could see here. He was able to provide us 18 primary ATRT samples coming from humans affected by this disease on a microscope, on a microslide so that we could, um, could stain them, do immunohistochemistry uh, staining, looking for activation of the mTOR pathway, which was known and we thought was probably regulated by LIN28 and might be upregulated in these tumors. What we found was that mTORC1 activation, so the mTOR pathway is divided into two, two different um, sub-pathways, the mTORC1 pathway and mTORC2. And the activation of mTORC1 could be seen by phospho-S6 expression that you can see at the bottom here. I don't know if there's a laser po pointer here, but you can see at the bottom the phospho-S6 expression. <laughs> So there was some activation of phospho-S6 or mTORC1, but what we saw and what we were surprised by was that this broad and intense activation of mTORC2 as seen by phospho-AKT expression. Right. So um, you could see phospho-AKT expression, which is uh, uh, showing activation of mTORC2. You see this broad, intense activation of mTORC2 throughout 60% of these tumors um, with this very high activation, and all 100% of these tumors had some activation of this pathway. So this made us feel that the mTORC1 inhibitors that are already FDA approved, like everlimus, rapamycin, probably weren't going to be effective in these tumors, both because mTORC1 isn't, highly, isn't quite as highly activated, 
but also TORC1 inhibitors can feed back and actually lead to a subsequent further activation of mTORC2. So we looked to um, dual TORC1, TORC2 inhibitors in, in ATRT. We looked at the medication TAC228. So this medication has already been uh, uh, developed in phase one and phase two clinical trials in adults. It's been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier and to, it's been shown to be fairly well tolerated um, in adults. So we looked to our in vitro models of ATRT, and we found that very low concentrations of TAC228 was able to effectively inhibit both TORC1 activation, as seen by phospho S6 in these Western blots here, as well as TORC2 activation, as you see by phospho AKT. So just 10 nanomolar concentrations inhibited the pathway, and the same concentration of medication was sufficient to decrease uh, cell growth and culture. So you can see the MTS assays at the bottom, 10 nanomolars significantly decrease cell density and cell proliferation uh, of ATRTs. So we next developed xenograph mouse models of ATRTs. Um, so we used two of our cell lines, um, BT12 and CHLA06. We implanted them in the brains of xenograph uh, of mouse uh, of nude mice. And then we started treating them with TAC228 at a, a dose of one milligram per kilogram by oral gavage once a day. This dose was roughly equivalent to the maximum tolerated dose in adults when TAC228 was given daily. Um, and we were, we were excited to see that it led to a very significant survival benefit. You could see in our BT12 cell line on the left, it nearly doubled median survival treating uh, once a day with TAC228. In our very aggressive CHLA06 cell line, it, it continued to extend survival. So the medication was um, being absorbed through the GI tract, it was penetrating the CNS um, and slowing the cell growth. So we're excited by these results, but we're tr this is potentially a modest benefit in survival. So we wanted to see how we could extend this survival benefit. And so we wanted to look back to exactly what TAC228 was doing in ATRT tumors so that we could figure out a rational design of combination therapies that might further enhance this benefit. So in scouring the literature, one thing that we found was that um, mTORC2 is involved in stabilizing the important anti-apoptotic protein, MCL1. So we felt that potentially using TAC228 to inhibit this pathway, we could decrease the expression of an anti-apoptotic protein, and that may pave the way for cytotoxic chemotherapy to come in and induce much higher rates of apoptosis, potentially decreasing some of this resistance that we see to the uh, chemotherapy that's given to ATRTs today. So we treated both of our cell lines, uh, BT37 and CHLA06, for 24 hours with TAC228, and we found that we do have a decrease in the anti-apoptotic protein MCL1. Um, the next thing we did was take a siRNA that's directed at Richter, which you could see effectively inhibits the mTORC2 activation, as seen by phospho AKT expression. And then we treated these cells with cisplatin or platinum chemotherapy. And we, as you see in the negative control, cisplatin does induce some apoptosis at baseline, but when you knock down the activation of TORC2, you induce very, much higher rates of apoptosis. So we looked at TAC228 with uh, platinum therapies in our in vitro models of ATRT, and we find that the combination is highly synergistic. Um, we looked at cell growth with a combination of medications at several different dose levels, and we looked at the Chutolale um, method of synergy, and everything below this line here is considered a synergistic interaction between the medications. And you can see clearly at all dose levels and many different cell lines, the combination is highly synergistic. Uh, similarly, we looked at uh, cells just in culture, and these are representative images uh, after um, uh, tumors are treated for 72 hours. And you see while the, you have very high density of tumor cells in the DMSO controls, more modest density in TAC228 and carboplatin treated alone, you see the combination is really de substantially decreasing the cell de density. If you look closer, you can see apoptotic uh, bodies uh, in, the, in the culture as well. Similarly, when we combine the treatment, we induce much higher rates of apoptosis in combination of TAC228 with platinum therapies compared to each medication alone. The next thing we did is look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of TAC228. 
Um, so we collaborate with a, an important collaborator that we've, we've been working very closely with and Kathy Warren over at the NIH. And so we took mice and we treated um, them with the weekly equivalent to the maximum tolerated dose in adults, this six milligram per kilogram dose of TAC228. And we euthanized mice between one and 24 hours after um, we treated them with the, the single dose. And you could see here that very quickly this medication is absorbed, crosses the CNS, and it gets to concentrations that are substantially higher than the therapeutic threshold needed to inhibit the mTOR pathway in vitro. Um, so you see a rapid, rapid absorption of TAC228 and then very quick metabolism of the medication. Similarly, looking at uh, pharmacodynamic uh, experiments with TAC228, uh, we very quickly um, inhibit the pathway. So one hour after administration of TAC228, we're inhibiting both TORC1 and TORC2 activation, and this inhibition uh, lasts for 8 to 24 hours. So this suggested to us, so, so we felt that if TAC228, one of its primary mechanisms is decreasing anti-apoptotic proteins so that cytotoxic chemotherapy can then induce much higher rates of apoptosis and decrease resistance to these cytotoxic chemotherapies, potentially we would get the best benefit by just giving weekly doses of TAC228, which we see here substantially um, increased over the concentration needed to inhibit our targets in vitro. Um, and potentially could lead to uh, a synergistic effect in vivo. So we developed a xenograft mouse model of our ATRT uh, tumors, and we treated them with that weekly dose of TAC228 in combination with carboplatin therapy. And we see while TAC228 is still leading to a substantial, a significant benefit compared to um, DMSO controls, the combination of carboplatin with TAC228 pushes out the survival curve significantly further and potentially leads to some uh, long-term survivors. So based on these uh, results, we're developing a, a clinical trial looking at combining TAC228 with carboplatin for uh, relapsed pediatric brain tumors. We've uh, been working closely with Kathy Warren, who has expertise in, in developing clinical trials, and we're in the final stages of, of seeking approval through the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium for this clinical trial that then could open up in 13 different pediatric hospitals throughout the country. But we want to see um, how we could further enhance this benefit. So we know that uh, TAC228 will decrease the MCL1 protein, and our feeling is that we're, we're greatly pushing these tumor cells to a pro-apoptotic phenotype so that the cytotoxic chemotherapy can, um, can increase survival. But what we find in culture is getting confused which one's which. Uh, what we find in culture is that after TAC228 administration, we're actually leading to a reflexive increase in some of the other important BCL2 family anti-apoptotic proteins. So especially in combination of TAC228 with cisplatin therapy, you decrease MCL1, but you get an increase in BCL XL and BCL2. So while we initially thought we're greatly weighting the cells toward this pro-apoptotic phenotype, the results might actually be more modest, where we're sort of tipping the balance to this, this pro-apoptotic uh, phenotype instead. And so we're looking at our apoptotic uh, cascade, and we felt potentially if we don't just inhibit MCL1, but we try to target these other anti-apoptotic proteins, we might be able to further enhance the benefit of this, this uh, platinum-induced apoptosis. And so we looked to a medication called Navitoclax that does just this. It's a small molecule inhibitor of BCL2 and BCL-XL. It also has been developed in phase one clinical trials in adults. Um, it's been found to cross the blood-brain barrier. It's been safe in, in clinical trials. And the nice thing is that Navitoclax and TAC228 are available through this NIH cancer therapy evaluation program that, sort of, that should help us combine these medications or get access to these medications to combine them in clinical trials. So when we treat our TAC228 or treat our ATRT cells in vitro, we see that the combination really is beneficial to inhibit all of these anti-apoptotic proteins. So you see a, a, decrease, a modest decrease in BCL-XL, you see a decrease in BCL-2 in combination, and a decrease in MCL-1. So we feel that we are really shifting these cells to this, this uh, greatly into the, towards this pro-apoptotic phenotype. 
when we treat cells in culture, we find that adding nevidoclax to TACT2A and carboplatin decreases the viable cells in culture as seen by this uh, viability cell sorting assay. Uh, we're also inducing higher rates of apoptosis as seen by this cleave caspase 3 assay. And finally, we did a Nexin 5 cell sorter that showed that, again, nevidoclax um, increases the, the rate of apoptosis in, in culture. So we're very excited about these results. We're working on in vivo studies proving this effect. But the, the one disappointing part of this project is that TAC228 combined with nevidoclax alone does not induce high rates of apoptosis. We still need this cytotoxic chemotherapy to sort of trigger these, these high rates of apoptosis. And as we have discussions, as I have discussions with families, especially in the relapse setting for pediatric brain tumors, many of the families believe that they've just, their kids have suffered through enough chemotherapy. The side effects of the chemotherapy have been a lot, and with the precious time that they have with their child, they just don't want to be in the hospital again. Blood transfusions, dealing with infections, um, and we really have to do more to decrease the, the morbidity or side effects of therapy. So as we're pushing these, these studies forward, we're trying to figure out ways how we could trigger this apoptotic effect without needing the cytotoxic trigger of, of conventional chemotherapies. And so while we were previously looking at sort of the, the upstream part of the apoptotic pathway to sort of get this apoptotic cascade rolling, what we might uh, have better luck with is if we start looking further down uh, stream in the apoptotic cascade. So caspase 3 is considered an executioner caspase. When it's activated, it directly cleaves um, cellular substrates, leading to cell death uh, directly. So potentially if we target this instead of this upstream part of the pathway, we could directly induce apoptosis without the cytotoxic trigger. And so looking through the literature, TAC228 has many functions. And one thing that it, it does has been shown that the mTOR pathway has been shown to be involved in is, is regulating this X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis. And what uh, Zyup or X-linked inhibitor of apoptosis does is that it actually prevents caspase 3 when it's activated from going and, and starting to cleave those cellular substrates and induce cell death. So potentially TAC228 could come in and inhibit um, x inhibitor of apoptosis and allow caspase 3 to do its job more effectively. But we know that TAC228 by itself does not induce high rates of apoptosis, so we have to have some sort of combination of medications to first activate caspase 3 so that it can then go uninhibited to, to cleave these cellular substrates. And so in culture, we do show that TAC228 does effectively decrease x inhibitor of apoptosis after 24 hours. And we started working with Paul Hergenrother uh, from University of Illinois. What Paul Hergenrother has done is he's developed a compound called PAC1, which helps activate caspase 3. There's zinc bonds that prevent the cleavage of procaspase 3 into its active form. And PAC1 goes in, it, it, it cleaves those zinc bonds so that the uh, cleavage site of caspase 3 or procaspase 3 is uninhibited and it could be um, more easily um, cleaved to its active form. Um, the nice thing about this medication has also been in phase one clinical trials. It's been used in brain tumors before, so it, it eff effectively crosses the blood-brain barrier. And our, our wonderful collaborator, Kathy Warren, has already started to push it um, into clinical trials in pediatrics um, as a, a single agent. So we look to see how effective PAC-1, uh, this is just showing where PAC-1 um, works in this uh, apoptotic cascade. So we started working on PAC-1 in ATRT. We see in, in cell culture, PAC-1 is very effective in decreasing viable cells in culture. This is our BT37 cell line with DMSO control after 72 hours versus uh, with BT37 uh, treated with PAC-1 over 72 hours. You can see there's a nice decrease in cell density as a representative image of culture. And then these are the viability cell assays that show that PAC1 effectively decreases the, the viable cells in culture. We also see that PAC1 effectively decreases procaspase 3. So procaspase 3 is being activated to caspase 3 at this dose of 
of PAC1, and at that same dose, we are inducing some level of apoptosis as seen by Cleve Parp. So we're starting to look at how PAC1 may work with TAC228, and our initial studies have shown that, uh, that there's good potential for combining these medications. So looking at MTS assays that look at cell density and culture, the combination is, is really slowing uh, cell growth when used compared to each medication alone. And then we also have looked at the combinations, their effect in inducing apoptosis. And whereas TAC228 and combined with Navidoclax really wouldn't increase uh, levels of apoptosis very significantly, you see that targeting this, this terminal event in the apoptotic cascade really does um, induce much higher rates of apoptosis. So we're very excited about this project. We feel like it very nicely can segue into a new clinical trial as our trials of TAC228 and PAC1 uh, can mature and as, as we get this uh, uh, preclinical data completed. So thank you again to the Children's Cancer Foundation for all of their support uh, of this work. Thank you for all the members of, of my laboratory who have been so critical to this work. Um, you, you know, Dr. Maxwell has already mentioned uh, Eric Robb, but his mentorship has really been critical to all this work. Charles Aberhart as well. And then Sabrina Wang is a uh, technician in our laboratory that has contributed to a lot of this work as well, as well as all the other members here. Thank you very much. It was a 2016. So. 2016. Yeah. So now this is, you know, two years later, and you are growing your own group, which is one of the really big objectives of this. So as you pointed out, um, it really is one of the important functions of CCF to do this. So thank you for all that acknowledgement. Um, and uh, are there questions? Uh, I have one. Yeah. Um, so you showed importance of various BCL family proteins, MCL1, BCLX, BCL2, but you only showed us like sort of total protein. Mm -hmm. Have you broken it down? Because we know that the balance for each one of those proteins between a short and a long isoform is very important for their pro-apoptotic or pro-survival mechanism. Yeah. Have you looked at how that balance might shift with the various approaches you've had? Because that might be something really critical to look at as well. Yeah, so that's that's a great point. So, you know, these, these apoptotic uh, pathways are, are complex, and, and how um, mTOR is regulating these, these apoptotic uh, pathways is certainly critical. So we've, we've looked at initial protein um, expression, and we looked at rates of apoptosis, but it certainly would be important to, to look at that. And uh, is it something that you've done in your lab? Is it, uh, yeah, so that's potentially something we could collaborate with oh, you to figure out exactly how to, how to have that done. It'd be very interesting. Jeff, great job. Um, one question I have is about PAC-1. So it takes off the groups that allow easier cleavage of caspase-3. Yeah. So what do you, do you think that there's, um, I'm just trying to understand how that would be a selective target in cancer versus mm -hmm. normal. And again, it, you know, you would imagine that we, apoptosis exists because it's part of our normal physiology. Yeah. So how is that going to affect apoptosis of normal tissues in those rates? And then how about, do you think that there's any special selective or should be any selective activity of that in ATRT relative to other cancers? Yeah, so a very, uh, very good question. So all cells have some ex expression of cas procaspase 3. Um, so all cells can be susceptible to PAC1, allowing the autocleavage or activation of caspase 3. Most importantly, the clinical trials have been done, and it shows that PAC1 is well tolerated and uh, appears to um, have a few side effects. So that's, that's the first step. What has been found in other tumor types is that the degree of expression of caspase 3 is really a biomarker for the susceptibility of these cells to PAC1. So tumor types like breast cancer and colon cancer, they have shown by immunohistochemistry that um, expression of procaspase 3 is significantly higher than surrounding t normal tissue, and that that higher level of expression actually makes it more susceptible to PAC1. Um, so that's something that we're pursuing in, in ATRTs. It's a little 
Um, we have these microarray, tumor microarrays of ATRTs that include some aspects of normal brain. So our plan is to do immunohistochemistry on procaspase 3 to see if expression levels are higher in ATRT compared to normal brain. On our cell lines, we've already done Western blots looking at it. It looks like there's very high levels of, of expression in, in ATRT. So it's encouraging, and it's encouraging that it shows some effect. But um, as you mentioned, and, and a lot of my goal is to make sure that our treatment is decreasing the morbidity of, of treatment in a tumor. So it's important that we do have a wide therapeutic index if we're going to use PAC-1. But uh, the clinical trials look like there, there is a fairly high level um, high degree of therapeutic index, and this, this degree of procaspase 3 activation really determines how susceptible tumors are going to be to it. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much.